Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Women at NCSA's April event, How to Prepare for the Next Step. We're excited to be partnering with SP NCSA SPIN and REU programs this afternoon. Um, so in order to be mindful of time, I want us to just go ahead and get started here. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we'll begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Weya, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all of our differences with native peoples at the core of our efforts. So many of you know that Women at NTSA provides professional development and networking opportunities for employee, employees, affiliates, and students. Our objective is to create a more diverse and inclusive environment through outreach, talks, and events such as this one. Today, we'll be discussing how to prepare for the next step in your life post-grad. So whether it's continuing education, joining the workforce, or both. My name is Jewel Goodley, and I'm an HR specialist at NCSA and a woman at NCSA committee member. Our expert panel will share their advice on things to do in college that will help with your career and their perspective on diversity in STEM. I'll go ahead and introduce our panel here. Diana Gomez is the Associate Director for Graduate Student Success at the Granger College of Engineering. Dr. Ruby Mendenhall is an Associate Professor of Sociology, African American Studies, Urban and Regional Planning, Gender and Women's Studies and Social Work. And she's also the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Democratization of Health Innovation at the Carl Illinois College of Medicine. We're joined by Jasmine Shaw, She's a Stanford University grad student and former SPIN intern, and Sarah Habib, a Caltech PhD student and former SPIN and REU inclusion intern. So the first portion today will just be a discussion with our panelists, and then we'll have time at the end for question and answer. So um, just wanna make a couple notes about the question and answer portion. You can include your questions directly in the chat if you wanna message those directly to me or during the question and answer portion, if you wanna unmute your mic um, and ask your question directly, you're able to do so. But outside of the question and answer portion, please just be mindful, um, keep your video off and your microphone muted. And then a couple last follow-ups here. This event will be recorded and then towards the end of the event, we'll submit um, a survey in the chat. It is very brief, um, it's anonymous and optional, but it is helpful for, for us to get some feedback. So we greatly appreciate if you can fill that out for us. So we're gonna start with Diana. Your professional focus is on student satisfaction, professional development, academic enrichment, and employee effectiveness. Could you share a little bit more about how to make yourself appear competitive on an application? Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. I'm very excited to see so many faces here at this event. Too bad that we're not meeting in person, but I guess everyone at this point is well accustomed to meeting via Zoom. Um, thank you for um, posing this question. Jewel, should I go in order that Alona had asked me to, um, to go over some questions or do you want me to start with this question specifically because I have some slides. You can share your slides and go in the order you've prepared. Okay, then I will share my slides now. Can you see my slides? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So um, as Joel had mentioned, my name is Diana Gonzalez and I'm the Associate Director for Graduate Student Success here at Granger College of Engineering. My understanding is that we have students from um, College of Engineering as well as outside. So um, what makes me qualified to speak about this topic is I have been working with students specifically focusing on um, 
graduate students for a number of years. Prior to my role at the College of Engineering, I worked at Giz College of Business for several years as an assistant and then associate director for graduate programs overseeing PhD program in business administration. And then right before pandemic hit last year, in March of last year, I had joined uh, College of Engineering. And my specific areas of oversight are college level graduate fellowships, uh, student policies, academic progress, um, and a couple of mentorship programs that we have on the college level, as well as any concerns that students may have, grievances, as well as um, uh, concerns about well being in general. And I work very closely with academic departments across um, the College of Engineering, as well as campus offices and units um, such as uh, Graduate College, Office of Dean of Students, um, Counseling Center, and other um, offices. So I was asked to speak to you briefly about college level fellowships and other funding that we have available here at Granger College of Engineering. We have two major fellowships that we offer for incoming students. One is called Carver Fellowship, which is our most prestigious fellowship. It is $34,000 in year one. It covers fall, spring, and summer terms, and it includes tuition and fee waiver. This fellowship is available to both groups in domestic and international student populations. It is by nomination. So when students apply to our graduate programs, they get selected to be nominated for this fellowship. So you cannot nominate yourself. Someone from the program has to nominate you. Our second largest and prestigious fellowship is called Surge. This fellowship is only open to domestic students and specifically for students from historically underrepresented groups in graduate education, specifically in engineering. Um, this also includes women. And this fellowship is a five-year fellowship program, which includes also tuition and fee waiver, as well as $25,000 stipend in year one, and then $4,000 supplementary stipend in years two through five. In addition, um, our office also administers um, some professional development funding opportunities. One is called Merge, and this is something that is a recruiting event that is held on our campus every fall. And in the last couple of years, we had to switch to online format. Students who participate in these recruiting events get an opportunity to speak with um, faculty and students in programs of interest, as well as administrators. And those who decide to go through this program and then apply to one of our graduate programs and subsequently get admitted and accept our offer of admission, receive $700 in professional development funds. Um, one of our major uh, mentorship programs is called Navy's Future Faculty Fellows Program. It is for senior PhD students who are interested in going into academia after they graduate. This is a very intensive program that lasts two semesters and it comes with $2,000 stipend that students typically use for professional development um, trips. You can learn more about our funding opportunities by following this link that they have listed on this slide. I'm also happy to share all these links as a follow-up email after this presentation. Another question that I was asked to um, briefly cover is the key differences between undergraduate and graduate studies. And there are so many different um, there are so many differences, but I just wanted to cover just a few basics. Um, for example, you see here a side by side kind of comparison table. Um, when you're an undergraduate student, um, what you're studying is a little bit more general. When you're going into grad school, it's because you're interested in something, something sparked your curiosity and your enthusiasm in your undergraduate studies. And now you want to become an expert. And so that's why you would want to go to a grad school because you want to be focused in a specific area. As an undergraduate student, you have mostly coursework and set curriculum. As a graduate student, um, you have some coursework, but you're also focusing on the research, um, especially if you're in the research oriented program, such as a research oriented masters or a PhD program. Our college specifically does offer some professionally oriented masters programs as well that do not have that research component and just have strictly coursework and also some real world experience through internships and some capstone projects. Also as an undergraduate student, you face frequent examinations. Graduate students also have examinations. They also have master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation. So that's the main difference. 
Um, as an undergraduate student, it is relatively easy to transfer to another program, especially early on, or even to another institution. As a graduate student, especially as a PhD student, it becomes a lot more challenging. Oftentimes, students change institutions only because they follow their advisor. There are also some restrictions on how many credit hours you can transfer. For instance, most of our programs only accept between 8 to 12 credit hours from earned outside, from the outside of our programs. So it's a lot more challenging to transfer between various programs. Also, as an undergraduate student, you, you have more time to engage in student life. And as a graduate student, you just don't have that kind of luxury. And so you're mainly, you mainly spend time focusing on your graduate studies, uh, working in the lab, and mainly interact within your research group. So what to consider, what questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about going, applying to a master's or a PhD program? Um, some of the things that you should consider is what type of degree are you interested in pursuing? A master's degree? If yes, then professionally or research-oriented programs? Or are you interested in going for a PhD program? Also, are you interested in enrolling part-time and working or are you interested in full-time enrollment? Online programs um, versus in-person programs. Directly uh, going to a, a graduate program directly after undergraduate uh, program or um, taking a gap year or two and working and then applying to grad school. But mainly you should be asking yourself, what are your career goals? What are you passionate about? What do you want to do with that education? What are the funding opportunities they are um, for graduate students? Do you, do you, does the program offer more funding opportunities for PhD students? How do you plan on paying for that? Will your employer pay for your um, education? Things like that. Also, um, do you live in the area where you can have balance between working and um, going to school if that's what you're interested in? Or are you simply looking for a break from school and then um, thinking about grad school after that? So these are all the different questions that you need to ask yourself. So one of the things that Alona had asked me um, to briefly mention is pros and cons of going to school part-time while working full-time. Pros are very simple. You don't have to leave your job. You don't have to leave your paycheck. So that's very convenient. So you can um, continue supporting your um, living lifestyle as well as you can pay um, for your educational expenses without losing that paycheck. You can also bring industry experience to your graduate studies. Oftentimes it's very beneficial in your research. Um, and then also uh, your employer may offer financial assistance. Now the cons are, it is a lot more challenging to strike a balance when you are working full time and going to school part time. Also your graduate experience most likely will not be the same because you mainly will be off campus. You will only be taking maybe a course or two per semester and you will just not be as fully engaged in the graduate studies as you would if you were a full time student. Also, it might be challenging if you are trying to um, go for a PhD for instance, it would be a lot more challenging to do both work and also conduct research. Uh, you may also not be eligible for um, certain university funding that is available only to full-time students. And finally, it would take a lot longer to earn your degree. Um, so when you're thinking about applying to graduate school, you really need to start planning ahead of time. So you have to do your homework and research graduate programs of interest. I also recommend to connect with schools either through national graduate fairs um, or through university recruiting events such as Merge that I had mentioned before. Um, you do have to maintain strong GPA. Strive for 3.5 and above, but also check with your program of interest what their minimum GPA requirement is. Also focus on getting competitive GRE score but keep in mind that, especially during pandemic, some of its requirements have changed and many programs now don't require a GRE score. Um, I hope that we have been focusing on gaining research experience if you're interested in pursuing a research-oriented um, degree program. So participate in REUs or summer internships, take independent study, um, work on senior thesis or capstone projects to demonstrate your research experience. Also focus on securing strong letters of recommendation. 
it is important to ask our recommenders that know you well. It's not about how well you know them. It is about how well they know you. Of course, if you have a chance to publish or present at academic conferences, that is something that all graduate schools will um, uh, greatly value. And if you have any awards and recognitions, that also looks really good in your resume. But one of the most important components as well is your personal statement or research statement. Here you have to highlight, why do you want to go to grad school? Why should we choose you? And most importantly, why are you choosing us? Requirements may vary by program and by institution. So make sure to customize your statement. Oftentimes students make a mistake by writing one statement and just submitting it with every application. And then it becomes very transparent that they have not done their homework, and that they're simply writing a blanket statement and applying to multiple programs. So it is important to customize your statement of purpose. So three key um, takeaways about your statement of purpose is selectivity of content. Must you must explain your interest in your field of study. So think about the fit and your motivation to succeed. Think about what makes you passionate about this specific area of interest. Uh, also, um, your statement has to be original. Tell your story and grab the reader's, reader's attention from the very beginning. So think of how can you demonstrate um, how different your story is from everyone else. Because looking at just applications, most students that will be competing that you will be competing against will have great GRE scores and great GPA, um, will have strong letters of recommendation. But that's where you can be original in your statement of purpose. And also make sure that stay clear and concise. A strong personal statement does take time and should go through many drafts. And you can always seek for um, someone to review your statement of purpose, um, your advisor or your friend or your um, re one of your recommenders. And this is it. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Diana. Diana, does the university or Granger offer any assistance with um, preparing students or helping students prepare for the GRE? Um, I don't know. It would be a question for undergraduate programs office, but I can certainly find that out and, um, and share it with you after the presentation. Great, thank you. All right. If there's no other questions, we can move to the next portion. All right, so next we'd like to hear from you, um, Dr. Mendenhall. You have quite an impressive resume and um, your research not only seems really interesting, but also important. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and share your slides and share a little bit more about your research, that would be great. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, can you all see the one slide, someone? Okay. Yes, thank Great. you. Um, and always during these times, I just always say thank you to our essential workers who um, have been really important during this pandemic. And so I was asked to just kind of talk about my experiences in the academy and then also um, issues around challenging um, challenges to recruiting and retaining, right? It's one thing to have students here, but then also, uh, to have them stay and to have them thrive. And then um, kind of solutions, right? I'm, I'm talking a lot about this idea of a third reconstruction and renaissance. So um, when I, my experiences in the academy are influenced by my background and my parents, um, first I'm African-American. My parents um, migrated from the South. Here's an image of my grandmother who was at a talk with Dr. King um, and her sister, who when she was young, she took care of her grandmother, who was my great great grandmother, who was an enslaved human. And I talk about this picture and I show this picture to um, stress that slavery is very recent in American history and that it was only one person between me and um, an enslaved human for them to tell their story and to pass it down. And, um, and also this, this idea of struggle, right? Because we're still trying to um, reach equality in the US and all of that affects 
uh, my experiences in the academy and other places. And so I think about, um, as we talk about third reconstruction, right, the first one was after slavery. And I saw this picture and I loved it immediately because a lot of my um, research, it talks about resiliency and it talks about um, kind of imagining what's not there, but then going to create it, right? As we talk about third reconstruction and Renaissance. And so here I see this as uh, people who may have been enslaved, but yet um, they are imagining, right? Freedom, imagining um, these green pastures and a house. And um, that influences kind of how I do my research. And also um, Dr. King, when he gave his talk, he talked about um, that a hundred years later, the Negro is still not free. And he talked about um, kind of these unalienable rights, right? That we talk about often um, as we founded the country, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so you think about like this movement that happened and that being the second reconstruction and um, eliminating in some ways, right, Jim Crow, but we still see it. Um, I'm from Chicago, one of the uh, most segregated cities in the country. And even when we did our racial microaggression survey about the university, uh, many of the students felt that the campus is very segregated. And that, um, and even sometimes when they go and try to cross other, um, we'll call them boundaries that they get um, checks, like what are you doing here or even name calling. And some of the different places include um, Green Street, right? Especially kind of after um, dark when um, students are drinking that that's um, a lot of times when um, they're um, kind of just kind of the language and assaulted sometimes even physically. And then also with fraternity parties or trying to kind of go in that area. And then um, even sometimes in the classrooms. And so we recently published um, a piece. So now I'll talk some about the challenges to recruiting. Um, so this isn't a piece that we published, but I did want to put this in here to show, again, when we talk about the first reconstruction, second reconstruction, um, this was a um, report that was done to investigate um, police violence in the US. And um, you'll see with number seven, they talked about violations of the um, rights to life, security and freedom, right? Some of the same things that were fought for before and talked about um, some of um, looking and investigating crimes against humanity. And that's what the police department, but um, many institutions in the US still have that um, legacy of slavery and makes it difficult for um, students to, um, come here, right, to the land grant institution and also to um, thrive. And so what I was starting to talk about earlier was um, a piece that we recently published, um, and this is a quote from a student, right, if you aren't white, Asian, or Indian, you aren't an engineer. And they talked about um, just the um, experience that they were having as um, students, sorry, as students of color um, trying to um, thrive in, certain departments with STEM. And so here, our research, we did both qualitative and quantitative, and we found that it's not um, inci um, isolated incidences of racial microaggression, but that they really are a part of the campus culture, they're in the syllabus, they're in um, kind of teaching, and sometimes um, professors or other students don't know. So we talk about racial microaggressions that sometimes it could be unconscious, but whether it's conscious or unconscious, the um, results are the same. And um, here with our research, we found that black students um, were more likely to experience racial microaggressions than other students of color. And some of the effects um, that I was asked to talk about, right, include a decreased sense of belonging and that other students may feel very strong, um, this university or other PWIs are um, a place where they can learn, their mind can um, be stimulated, and it's a place where they can grow. Others may feel that it's a place where often their limits, their genius is challenged. Um, sometimes as a result of that, students may change majors. Um, some have left the university. Um, some have talked about mental health. Um, one of the students talked about in a class where um, the professor was saying some things about um, students of color, where they live, kind of expectations. 
and that they went home and they just slept for hours and hours. And they talked about how they knew that they should have been up and reading and kind of doing their homework, but the experience was so exhausting for them that they just couldn't um, muster it up. And in fact, they kind of um, went into like a depressed state. And then also um, physical health. Students talked about um, losing or gaining weight or having headaches because sometimes you can't avoid, some things you can avoid, right? Some people you can avoid, but one of the things that's really difficult to avoid is your classes that you have to um, go there, you have to do well. So sometimes students talk about um, maybe not talking with their advisors as much or um, not going to office hours because those are some of the places that they have the racial microaggressions. And so all of those affect, um, as I said, their ability to um, thrive while here, but some of the other issues that I talked about affects the ability to have students of color um, on campus. And so that's why I think this idea of third reconstruction and renaissance, um, I was at an NSF meeting and someone um, talked about this research by Louis Weiss, um, Louise Weiss and others, um, the squish, squishy ball, right? They talked about in terms of society that will apply pressure with the, um, right? You can think about the civil war after the, um, before the first reconstruction or the civil rights movement. But once that pressure is released, it kind of goes back into its shape and the need to create new shapes, the need to create new pathways and um, new ways of teaching and new types of engagement so that all students, um, students of color, first generation students, students from rural areas, when they get here, they also feel like it's a place where they can thrive. And um, one way I argue is um, this idea of community science and innovation, but the community, community science is the idea of um, different departments from the university working with um, one or two communities and that way the faculty, the um, students, undergrads, graduate students are there in the community working with the young people, working with their parents, and they create this um, pathway to whatever major the young people um, feel is their gift or their genius. And then also out of that comes research around um, issues of health and wellness, issues of um, how to succeed in um, um, high school or even college. And then the, I think this is the last slide, um, right, as part of the land grant mission, um, we often celebrate the rose growing out of the concrete, but I'm arguing with community science and other things that if the potential of the student is to be a rose bush and to have all these great ideas and these um, ways that we could innovate, innovate or cures for diseases, then that's kind of the setting, the context that we need to create um, with the third reconstruction and the third renaissance. And I just love this picture of intensity because I always think about it, um, no matter what's happening with her outside of her environment, that um, there should always be a place where she could come or he and apply their, um, or non-binary students to apply their um, gifts and passion. So um, I think that's it, thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions at this time? Okay, we'll go into our last portion before the question and answer portion here. So Jasmine, you were a former um, SPEN student who worked after graduation, and now you've made the decision to go back to grad school. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about your experience with NCSA's um, SPEN program and how this led to um, future planning and decisions? Yes, hello everyone. Um, it's nice to be back in kind of like a school setting where um, even though it's virtual since I've been, uh, I graduated two years ago and um, I had been working in the research part of, um, of the U of I um, at Yahoo and I um, will be going to Stanford um, this fall. Um, can I just say, I'm sorry, I don't know if others can hear well. I'm having trouble hearing. Oh, can you, um, do you hear me at all? Okay. Yeah, that's a little better, thank you. Okay, I will just uh, increase my volume. Okay, uh, all right, I'll bring the computer closer to, uh, and uh, um, just shout anytime you can't hear me clearly, because um, yeah, I'm hearing myself all the, all the time, so I won't be able to know. 
Um, so yeah, I'll talk about my experience with the SPIN program. So I joined um, as a SPIN uh, intern my sophomore year of college. I was a computer science major and I joined the advanced visualization lab. Um, my mentor was um, Kalina um, for my and, and um, Jeff for my first two years where I worked on their um, remodeling their uh, website, the website of the advanced visualization lab. And um, so <clears throat> um, during that time, I already had a lot of uh, deep interest in web, de uh, web um, development and getting to work more on the front end side of web development was really helpful for me career wise because that helped me um, figure out that I uh, become more sure that I was really interested in this. So um, in a sense, it was um, influential to me and I, decided, I ended up getting um, a software engineering internship at Yahoo um, after my first two years of um, internship at this, uh, in the SPIM program. Um, and especially because uh, in my the second year, I worked as a design intern, and um, it was really interesting to see how she designed um, websites and actually implementing her designs. So um, that was the first part of my um, SPIN internship. And the last year of my SPIN internship, my senior year, I actually started working on research. Um, I had never done research before, but I always had going to grad school in mind. And I, and, um, I was considering um, working in academia. So I knew that research um, could be, um, if I do go into, decide to go into academia, um, research would be a huge part of it. So when my mentor Kalina mentioned to me that it would be um, a cool project to do research in my last year of the SPIN internship, um, I thought it was a really, I was really glad to be given this opportunity. And um, we did some brainstorming to go over several ideas because the um, advanced visualization lab um, had over the years worked on many different projects. And at that time they were working on a moon formation visualization project. And so we kind of just um, decided to investigate the value of developing um, scientific, interactive cinematic scientific visualizations in the game engine um, to explore the process and also to examine the value of the end result. So um, the research experience was really valuable to me. There were three different stages um, of the project. Um, I did some um, benchmarking, kind of worked like a scientist, like run, ran experiments on a computer um, in the game engine. And then the second stage I developed um, a, a visualization using the, the game engine, which is uh, where, uh, where I got to apply my existing coding skills. And then the last stage was, uh, it was the most interesting part to me where I got to show my uh, the visualization I developed to um, to school age kids um, do, at engineering open house and I collected survey responses from them to examine the the effects of the visualization on these young kids attitude towards the subject and also um, the difference between an interactive version of the visualization and the and a video version. And working on the research project really allowed me to get my feet wet in research, which um, in school was really would be really hard to get if I just um, if I just took classes because our classes were more um, some were more theory based and some were more application based. But none of none of the classes really taught us how to do research until maybe later on we would have some options um, to take research focused classes, and so. Um, it allowed me to also explore my areas of interest um, interest in interactive visualizations and also user centered research. Um, the research experience also really strengthened my idea, my decision to go to grad school um, to learn more about these uh, specific fields um, specific, and which are both, which would bo both fall under the field of human computer interaction, which is what I'll be specializing at Stanford. 
and uh, and I think uh, very importantly, it also prepared me for the type of work I would be doing as a grad student in addition to taking classes. Just like Diana said earlier, um, there are different choices um, in your graduate program. Usually there's a uh, coursework only and there's also some that involves some research. And I think having done research in my during my undergrad, um, my senior year really helped me um, not only uh, gave me a chance to get a better idea of what it's like to work on research, but also um, uh, gave me an opportunity to build some skills in that area. Great, thank you, Jasmine. We'll move into our question and answer portion. So like I mentioned um, at the beginning, if you wanna leave a question in the chat, if you wanna directly send questions to me, or if you wanna unmute your mic and ask a question to our panelists, you are able to do so. And um, we do have a question already for Diana. And this question is from Rachel Orfano. In regards to personal statements, is there a certain student story that really struck out to you? Um, this is a great question. I had advised a student who was a, a master's student, and this is from my experience at Giz College of Business. Um, I had a, a master's student who was highly interested in pursuing a PhD, pro, uh, PhD education, but um, his level of preparedness was pretty low. But his proactivity really made up for, um, for that uh, shortcoming. So he was at my office um, probably every couple of weeks um, asking for my advice. We worked out a, a plan for him to um, improve his resume, improve his qualifications for um, and, and build his uh, really credentials to become a competitive applicant. So it wasn't so much the, the personal statement or a statement of purpose in this case, it was really his determination and his, um, his ability to create a plan and follow through in a very short period of time. So within a year, this student went from being um, not very competitive applicant to becoming a highly competitive applicant and then um, being selected for the admission to the program of interest. All this happened um, outside of my involvement with the search committee or anything. They did not know that the student um, had sticked my advice and that he came on a regular basis. And um, so when I saw his name on the admission list, I was really, really thrilled. And so that was one of the highlights of my um, advising experience, seeing that progress in the student and seeing his determination to become a competitive applicant. Thank you, Diana. There is another question um, and it is, what is the significant difference you have experienced between industry and research? And I think that question is for Jasmine. Okay, I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, so I spent uh, close to two years in the industry uh, working at Yahoo on an internal web application. So I think the experience that you would get in the industry can still vary greatly depending on the type of work and um, the company you're in. Um, but I think a major difference for me is, um, specifically was I think um, for it, working in the industry, you are um, contributing to the company and the company specifically. And the company's goal is to make money, make revenue or, or um, either that, or you're kind of working as a support um, person. You're supporting the company's um, infrastructure um, in the software field. Well, so my the application I worked on was an internal web ap application for um, managing cloud projects and tracking cloud projects and cloud resources. Um, so in that aspect, it wasn't really very closely related to uh, my interest area. So in a sense, it kind of it kind of just feels like I was um, like helping the company, um, helping maintain the tools that are used by the company and the and the and other employees in the company. But I was, um, but I did feel like I grew um, a lot technically. My technical skills grew a lot, which would be a different experience from um, what you would get from research because um, research also varies a lot. But from my own research experience, it was a lot more, there was a lot more freedom 
um, and uh, when it comes to uh, the, or there was a direction because I was working with the um, advanced visualization lab, but um, throughout the way, we always had um, meetings to talk about um, things that we could try out for the for um, the research. And we were always, um, we I always felt free to make a little change if I really wanted to. So for example, initially the research was gonna be just on the technical side. So um, benchmarking the, um, the game engine's performance, um, uh, the, the, perform the computer, uh, like graphics performance and things like that. So more on the um, software side and um, statistics and things like that. But later on, um, AJ, who was also my mentor, suggested um, doing doing like a um, user study to examine also the result because I was um, interested in um, the human side of visualizations too. So there was a lot more freedom um, with working on research. And because the research topic was really, um, was very closely aligned with my own areas of interest, I felt that my sense of purpose was more fulfilled in that sense. But um, so I think that's a significant, that's the most significant difference between industry and research. In industry, you are um, contributing to the company's um, business. Whereas in research, if you're working on a topic that's, um, that you really care about, then you are, you feel like you're contributing to something that's bigger. Thanks, Jasmine. We have another question for Ruby, and this is from Hailey Connors. As an African, as an African American woman, I noticed that there are not many students that look like me and relate to me in my classes, and also from my research experiences. Is there any advice you can give for marketing or networking and how to meet mentors that can understand my struggles and differences as a minority? Yeah, I would say two things. And, and I put in chat, um, pronounced Haley. Okay, thank you. Um, undergrad, okay. And um, Haley, I would say um, a couple of things, right? One thing is to find other groups of students of color that can kind of share. And so they may be outside of your immediate major, um, but kind of to get the sense of community and to have a space where you can say, wow, let me tell you what happened. That was messed up, right? Um, and then also to think about um, in terms of networking for or with faculty um, to look um, in your department or other departments for faculty who are doing something that's really interesting to you that you would like to um, learn more about and see if they could use support. Well, first of all, see if they have a paid position, right? So you kind of want to be careful um, in terms of um, kind of the work that you do, the labor, right? We talk a lot about hidden labor. So um, if they have paid positions or not, that you could um, attend meetings, maybe you could help them with um, writing publications, um, to helping with the literature review. I publish with undergraduate students and, um, and all the time, it doesn't have to be um, faculty of color, that can be helpful. There are um, faculty from all backgrounds who are really interested in supporting students of color. So I would say, and I'll probably have some more that I'll put in chat, but I would definitely say one thing, it is important to have a sense of community, right? Like the isolation we found from the racial microaggression study really kind of takes a toll on you. And so um, that's really important. And then um, what, and, the this is a big university and there are a lot of things happening. So again, to kind of look around to see what you may like to do and then to um, just approach faculty, don't be um, shy. Um, it may be intimidating, right? Like you can be intimidated, but still do it. Anyway, I've had students from uni high school um, send me emails and ask, can they shadow or can they um, work with me. And, I, and I've been like, yeah, sure. And because I'm so impressed, right? Like high school students are trying to be in this world. And so I, I bring them in and give them what we talk about as unprecedented access. So um, those things are important. And as I, as I sit here and think about some more, um, I will definitely put some things in chat. Mm -hmm. um, prepare. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. 
Ruby, we have another question for you. Um, right now, diversity and inclusion can sometimes feel like buzzwords for organizations. So what do you think that the university or certain organizations need to do in order to actively participate in expanding their diversity and inclusion without just making it feel like tokenism or um, just like using the buzzwords? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that's when I talked about labor because it really is hard work, right? In, in meetings I talk about, um, and that's why I started with kind of the history and the legacy of slavery, right? We are up against that. And for Native Americans and for Latin and for other groups, right? Like there are these really big um, structural, um, um, as I'll say structures, there's these really big structures in place and it takes a lot of labor and um, intensity to try to shift that. And so one of the ways that the university is doing, first of all, they, they are doing, uh, we are part of the university doing um, a lot of coming together with different groups from across campus and community members um, to address racism. And um, one of the groups I'm in is looking at um, access to technology. And I've heard stories about um, students, um, um, African-American students who didn't have access during the pandemic and were struggling and it just broke my heart. And I think um, this moment that, that the university is doing a lot of activity, like this is when we can ramp it up and we can put all of the re financial resources, but also um, community members and others' time and talent to change. And so one of one very specific example is um, the Nobel project that I'm working on that is trying to give um, students of color, first generation and other students um, unprecedented access to computer science. So we've had um, Nobel laureates come in. We call them Nobel scholars because we want them to have um, an experience where they feel free, confident, that they can create ideas that society needs that are outside of the box. And we don't want them to feel limited by that. Um, and it's also a pathway to computer science, to the College of Medicine or any program. So even now we're trying to create workbooks that you can hand to parents. And, and basically like these are some of the steps that you need to do to, um, if your child is interested in college, maybe college isn't their gift or genius, maybe it's something else, but to try to um, give them different um, pathways so that they can fulfill that. So, so that's one. Um, I, I just think it really does take a lot of time, effort, energy, and money, right? Sometimes people say, oh, you can't throw money at the problem. Yeah, money definitely can help pay for the labor that's needed. It can provide students with resources, many students of color, they are first generation. I see it in my class where they're working um, one, maybe two jobs and sending some of the money home to their parents. And then I have other students whose parents are sending them everything they need, right? So even there you see this, um, this difference that makes it hard for those students to thrive in um, these types of environments. Thank you. We have another question for Diana. What do you think are the top three things that students overlook when preparing their applications for grad school? One of the things that students oftentimes overlook, as I mentioned, not customizing their statement of purpose. Um, that becomes very visible. Another is kind of retelling your resume and the statement of purpose instead of focusing on what really um, interests you in this program and what, um, what makes you a good fit for this program. Um, and just in general, not connecting with schools and not learning enough about school before applying, um, that makes a big difference in, in writing that statement and really make you stand out. Naming um, some research uh, groups or, um, you know, um, naming um, some faculty members, making those connections prior to applying can strengthen your application in general. Thank you. Let's see, are there any more questions? Okay. I've got one here for Jasmine. Jasmine, what is the biggest challenge in taking a break from higher education, um, joining industry, and then going back to pursuing, pursuing advanced degrees? Um, 
I think the biggest challenge would be um, the pause in um, education, um, because when I was working in the industry, it was um, admittedly, it felt really, it started to feel very comfortable. I was earning a good salary and I had um, like after five o'clock every weekday, I had um, all of that time to myself and um, all of the weekends too. So it could feel really, um, if you're not careful, you can feel really comfortable um, just working in the industry. And, and you might, so initially I had plans to go to grad school even before I started working full-time, but, um, when it come when it came time to start my application process, it was a bit of a struggle because um, preparing for the GRE um, and also um, uh, preparing the personal statement and just the applications themselves and um, all of the paperwork and um, sending letters to to potential recommenders, it, it was a lot of work. Um, so you really need to be very determined. So you, it's good to have very clear goals for why you're returning to school. Otherwise, it's it's very easy to feel that you're um, financially comfortable and you feel like you can have a future in the in your current job too. Then you might. Um, feel a little less motivated about going back to school. But once you once you um, pick up the, the motivation back, um, then um, it'll come back to you. And it did come back to me. And then now I'm very excited um, to, to start my graduate journey. I like the idea of picking up a motivation back. That's good. All right, Let's see if there's some more questions here in the chat. All right, this one um, I think will be for Jasmine again. Um, if you could share any roadblocks or challenges you experienced as a woman in STEM. Um, I think it's just, it's just more difficult to find, um, to, to have that sense of belonging. Cause I think um, actually before high school, I never thought I would go into the, um, the STEM or STEAM field. Um, mostly because I was a student in Asia and it was usually girls don't go into, into STEM. But um, in high school, I had a group of um, girls who um, I would take all of these advanced science and math classes with. And I really felt a, a big sense of belonging. And um, with these, with taking these classes with um, other people who are also, um, also female and, um, and also um, it boosted my confidence. I feel like if they can do it, I can do it too. And so um, that was a little hard to find in college when I was in these um, 300 people computer science classes, there were not a lot of women. And, and also when I um, started working full-time, there was also not a lot of women. Um, so I think finding people who, um, who you feel like you, um, who, um, like finding other women was a big challenge, um, but um, I think it's getting better because when I entered school, it was uh, in college, I think our um, male to female ratio was getting was getting um, better in terms, it was getting more closer to 50-50 um, at the U of I, and that was really promising. And then um, uh, I actually had a um, female, uh, manager in my first job, and she really helped me and um, with everything that I was because I was uh, fresh out of college. I was um, not sure about a lot of things, and um, it was really um, helpful to have a manager who was your gender, especially if you're kind of in the minority um, in that field. But yeah, it's just uh, the the biggest uh, challenges would be finding other people who are similar to you, who share similar experiences in the field. But I think there are increasingly more resources. There are um, there are always um, in the industry. There's a lot of um, there's a big emphasis on employee resource groups. So there's always one for women usually. So those are, you can join, and then you can always um, talk to other women at work and and find mentor find people who would be willing to mentor you. And it's really useful. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Um, see, I have a question here for Ruby. What do you feel are some common racial microaggressions that people encounter? 
Yeah, so we um, talk about um, one in the um, training that we do is um, actually with Biden um, and President Obama, right? When they were running and he was like, oh yeah, you have the first um, good looking, um, articulate, clean, um, African-American running for the presidency. And when you hear that, you think, okay, all of those are good, right? Like it, but there was this firestorm behind it and, and the, um, the historical, right? Kind of, um, what do you wanna call a storm that he unleashed was this idea of the African-Americans traditionally aren't um, articulate, aren't intelligent, right? Aren't clean. And so those subtle ways that people um, bring in that history that I talked about, the history of, of you're not smart, that you don't belong. Um, we still have, um, there's micro invalidations, right? So if you um, try to um, speak up, I, I'm looking at the language in the, that's happening in the chat, right? And so sometimes when you um, voice your um, kind of opinion and people may say, oh, you're too sensitive or may dismiss it, in some ways, then that's a micro invalidation. And one example is people say, oh, I don't see color, everyone is the same, but then that erases the, the whole history. Like if someone told me that, then it erases the whole history that I started my story with about how my great, great grandmother was enslaved and how that affects um, my life today, that affects um, when I'm pulled over by police, how comfortable I feel, that affects how I teach my children, how to go out into the world, right? It, um, erases all of that. And then also with um, racial slurs, uh, micro assaults, right? And they talk about it kind of similar to old fashioned um, racism, but then that is hidden that the person wouldn't necessarily um, write certain words and then say, yeah, I'm the one that said that. Things have changed some in our society, but when we were um, just kind of starting to do that, normally people wouldn't um, do the slurs and, and say, yes, that that's me. So those are um, some of the examples, but really with the invalidation and the um, insults, right, too, where um, people may say something like, oh, um, people, people like you um, don't um, come here, right, like they, they aren't, um, they aren't here, and that may be all that they say, but then the message behind that could be like people, um, from what, whatever marginalized group you wanna think about, like that they don't thrive. And um, the last thing I'll say about that is we also do research on um, environmental racial microaggressions. And so how the um, built environment is set up, how policies are set up. And one student talked about how um, at different dorms, there were different rules about the book bags. Like some, some um, places you you don't have to leave your book bag at the front in some places you do and they felt those places were um, set based on dorms that had lots of students of color and so for that student that was an environmental racial microaggression because they felt the policy was different based on the group that was there and then the message that it conveyed to him is when there are groups with high level students they're concerned about um, um, I, I, he felt they were so um, concerned about students taking things or this idea of criminality. So those are some of the examples. Thank you. Um, we're wrapping up near the end here. We've got about two minutes left. Um, if there's some more questions in the chat. Um, Sophie's answered some questions and Ruby has responded to some questions in the chat as well. So please take a look at that. Um, before we wrap up, just another reminder, um, that Sophie's going to include the link to our survey. But if we have any final questions before we have to say goodbye to our panelists today, please include them or um, send them to either Sophie or I. Okay. No final questions. All right. All right, it looks like we're wrapping up. There weren't any other yeah. questions. Like I said, Sophie included the link to the survey. Um, and thank you everyone for joining and thank you to our panelists for being with us this afternoon. And I would like to thank you on behalf of SPIN and RU programs and other RU students on this campus. Thank you panelists for your perspective, for sharing the wealth of information, wisdom and knowledge. Thank you so much for supporting our programs at NCSA.
Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.